A new political era in France on the horizon as the country's presidential election enters the home stretch. And Donald Trump's first 100 days in office. Just how will history judge his achievements? We'll examine the fallout from the biggest stories of the past seven days. This is Insight Review. Welcome to Insight Review, our look back at the most read and clicked and shared stories of the past seven days. It's been a week where France edged a step closer to choosing its new president. The choice now between the unknown centrist Emmanuel Macron and the hardline far-right leader Marine Le Pen. Also ahead, Ivanka Trump booed as she defends her father's record on women's rights. We'll examine those stories and much more with our guests the broadcaster and journalist Paul Osborne, and the author and broadcaster Paul Blazard. But first, here's what you need to know about what happened this week. Seven days in 60 seconds. After an extraordinarily close race, French voters shortlisted Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen for the next round of France's presidential elections. France will return to the polls on May 7th. The U.S. government installed an anti-missile defense system in the South Korean village of Seongju as tensions with Pyongyang continue to rise. More than 70 Russian sailors were rescued after a Russian spy ship sunk in the Black Sea north of Istanbul. The vessel collided with a passing merchant ship in heavy fall. More than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners continued a hunger strike which entered its second week. The prisoners are demanding an end to solitary confinement and imprisonment without trial. And after a 15-month suspension for doping, five-time Grand Slam champion Maria Sharapova secures a straight sets win against Italy's Roberta Vinci in the first round of the Stuttgart Open. Well, France moved one step closer this week to deciding who its next president will be, with the first round of the country's elections taking place last Sunday. And with the spectre of Brexit looming large, commentators called it the most uncertain and unpredictable election in France in recent memory. With just a percentage point or two between them, en marche is Emmanuel Macron and the Front National's Marine Le Pen emerged as the victors, who will now go head-to-head -head in the second round on May 7th. TRT World's Miriam Francois reports. It was an election night in France like no other. Ahead of the final round in two weeks, it now appears that a man who has never held elected office has moved from outsider to front runner. Emmanuel Macron now favorite to be the next French president at the age of just 39. Leading his onwards movement, which he only started a year ago, He's staunchly pro-business and pro-European. A lack of political experience now seems to be his advantage. Je souhaite, dans 15 jours, devenir votre président. I hope in 15 days to become your president, the president of everyone in France. I will be the president of patriots against the threat of nationalists, a president who protects, transforms and builds, someone who allows those who want to grow work, innovate and travel, to do so more easily and quickly. If Macron represents a new voice, the contrast is provided by Marine Le Pen of the National Front. Like her father Jean-Marie in 2002, she's led the party into the second round. A controversial candidate in many ways, she redesigned her party to appeal to a wider base of voters. Les Français French people have to seize this historical opportunity. At stake, there is the wild globalization that threatens our civilization. The French people have a very easy choice. Well, joining me on today's program, the broadcaster and journalist Paul Osborne and the author and broadcaster Paul Blazard. Welcome, gentlemen. So let's talk to France. Who's going to win? Oh, Emmanuel Macron's going to win. Um, You're I, absolutely certain about that? I, I say this as somebody who said there was no way Britain would vote to leave the European Union and there was no way that Donald Trump will become president. So your track so record is appalling. I think most of our track records are fairly <laughs> appalling at the moment. Me too. <laughs> but you have to assume that with so many candidates in the race, uh, I, I believe one third of Fillon supporters have suggested that they could go to Le Pen, but you would assume the bulk of Mélenchon supporters will, will go behind Macron. And we, We've got a precedent for this um, when Jean-Marie Le Pen got into the runoff in 2002. 
Jacques Chirac, not the most popular man with the, the left-wing side of France, still got 82% of the vote. A lot of people were literally holding their nose in the voting yes. booths as they did but it. But that there was, was a then. sweep behind him. A lot has changed in the last this 15 years. This is now, Paul, don't you think? There's uh, a different kind of atmosphere amongst the electorates I think around the world. What's happening in France is extraordinary, and I think it's sort of unique. I understand what Paul's saying, and I, of course we sincerely hope that actually um, it, it's not Marine Le Pen that wins. Um, we don't need another sort of nationalist, uber-nationalist sort of right-wing party starting to, to, to creep forward in Europe. But I think there are some troubling signs. One is, obviously, polls have got things drastically wrong over the last 12 months, yeah. and all the indications that we're seeing coming out of France are largely driven by pollsters into you know, what Mélenchon's team or Mélenchon... Um, sure. Um, I mean, on a head-to-head -head that I read only an hour ago or so, as we record on Friday, it was about 60%, 40%, so it's a clear win. Um, yes, for I mean, Macron, think, but, but you know, the these polls have been that. wrong before, haven't they? Well, the trouble is, I think there is that sneaking suspicion there are going to be a lot of French voters who are not actually saying what they're going to do, yes. actually in the privacy of the, the polling of, booth. Of, of, of yeah. the polling booth, and I think that's one of the great worries. There is enormous amount of discontent amongst the electorate. For the first time ever, we're seeing the two main French parties for the last 50, 60 years not, not participating in yeah. a major election. All bets are off, surely. It is extraordinary uh, to think that the Socialists and the Republicans between them could only get 26% of the vote or something. I think the Socialist candidate got 6%. Um, th there is a risk that mainstream politicians, if Marine Le Pen is defeated, there's a risk that mainstream politicians in Europe will say, well, look, we saw off Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. We've seen off Marine Le Pen. The AFD in Germany seems to be imploding a little bit. The UK Independence Party's vote share seems to be plummeting ahead of the general election in the UK. We've seen off the populist right. It was a bit of a danger and a bit worrying. Well, complacency but creeps but in. But we've seen them off. And that yeah. would be very dangerous because we are still in the situation where the leader of the National Front, for the second time in 15 years, has got through to the runoff in France. Yeah. And the idea of Frexit, which seems to be one of Marine Le Pen's, you know, complete throwing away the European project, um, I mean, that would spell problems for everybody, wouldn't it, if, if that ever came about? Well, of course, the great fear from, from Germany's perspective and Merkel's perspective is that France, if France were to leave, so say Marine Le Pen gets in and say that she gets in on the Frexit ticket and has yeah. to follow through, that's the end of the European Union. Surely France is such it, a major sure, contributor. Exactly. It's the end without of it. Britain, without France, we're talking no more EU. Yeah. And what about the, the ability, which we always ask, of presidential candidates? Once you've won, if, you've win, if you win, once you've won, how do you then pull this country together again? Because well, you sort of, your core support is negligible, isn't well, it? Well, Macron has a big problem here, of course. Even if he were to win the populist vote and to actually gain the presidency, he would then have... He's got nobody in the Senate. He's got no No party. natural supporting machinery, Well, there's no natural machinery, support, there's no it? machinery. Although he has political experience, it's sort of... Um, it, it's sort of oblique. He, he's, he's, never, he's never held elected office before. So, again, so it's a massive versus a massive risk. The rest of government seen, will be an interesting dynamic, wouldn't it? We've seen someone with no political experience reach very high <laughs> office in the last few months. And, of course, he has marketed himself, in a way, as being a different choice, as being someone who doesn't come from yes. that. The, France, more than a lot of other countries, very much as a sort of a professional government machine. People go to a specific college to learn how to work in government yeah. in a way that they don't tend to do in many other countries. Yeah. He's marketed himself as something different. The challenge, assuming he does win, as you say, is working with all those people yeah. who are part of that system. We'll come on to novices in the job in just a moment, but let's go to Germany first, shall we, where President Trump's daughter was booed on stage as she attempted to defend her father's record on human rights. Ivanka Trump, who's faced fierce criticism for her unpaid but official White House role as an advisor to her father, was speaking at a women's summit organised by the group of 20 major economies. She was joined on stage by the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, and the IMF Managing Director, Christine Lagarde. It was an interesting combination of uh, talent on the stage there, wasn't it? A, not a natural bond between them, would you say? A Dutch queen, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, Angela Merkel, one of the most powerful women in the world, and Ivanka on her first overseas trip, representing her father, representing the United States of America... Representing something. Representing something, you <laughs> don't quite know. And although it's very easy to cast rocks, I'm, I'm not without sympathies for her. I'm beginning to think that it's wrong to, for the sins of the father to be visited on the daughter. Mm -hmm. I get the impression that she has a good heart. I think she's got a pretty good mind. People I know that know her say that she's the real deal and she really does care. And a terrible position for her to find herself in. However, it is, you know, a great example of why nepotism in politics should be best avoided. You cannot sack 
well, she can't sack her father, her no. father can't sack her. We don't really know what she's doing, how she's doing it, or what really the authority she carries with her is. And we in which case, Paul, as an advert for punching through the glass seizing, getting the job done, you know, a woman can do it just as well as anyone else, She's not a great advert for that, because we know how she got the job. There's no, no, there's no meritocracy. Sorry. A, woman, a woman can rise as high as, as working in the White House as an advisor to the president as long as her father is the president. Um, I have a certain sympathy, again, with, with, with what Paul said, that I don't think it's necessarily fair to be standing outside and protesting and booing somebody, and the, your principal sin is your father's an awful man. Mm -hmm. is, is not in itself particularly fair. But I also have a slight concern that an awful lot of people all over the world are investing an awful lot of hope in Ivanka Trump and saying she's going to be the moderating influence, she's going to yes. be able to pull Donald Trump back a little bit and yeah. control him. We don't really know very much about her, we don't know what she thinks, we don't know what her views and opinions are, but we've somehow convinced ourselves that Ivanka and Jared Kushner are going to be this kind of leash that's going to pull back yes. Donald Trump on things like climate change. And in all due respect, as you say, they're probably very bright people, very able and so on, but they're relatively, they're, well, they are novices at politics, aren't they? Dad Real politics. is the boss. I mean, and if there is an alpha male in that set, it's going to be Donald Trump. He's the president yeah. of the United States of America. I think, I mean, this is a, this is a terrible terribly worrying sort of formation of a dynasty that that has troubling consequences if it's seen through to its sort of natural conclusion. The only great hope we have is that the, you know, the th two other branches of the executive seem to have done a pretty good job in railing in the worst excesses of their new, uh, somewhat newbie president. Uh, and if, if Ivanka Trump can um, improve the relationship between her father and Angela Merkel, then that would be a good thing because their mm. meeting didn't seem to go terribly well. I think Mrs. Merkel felt a little bit embarrassed at her getting booed. But then again, sitting on a stage surrounded by other very powerful women and saying that Donald Trump is a great force for advancing the cause of women is... Mm. is he didn't a, it, say that. That's a tough she, sell. It's a tough sell for anybody. She, yeah, no, absolutely, and that's why I have sympathy. She said that he's... She didn't say that he's a great force for advancing women, although she did say the tens of thousands of women that have worked for him wouldn't say a bad word against him. Well, let's ask them. But she did say he's been a great force for... Um, for families, for raising mm. families, and that was the sort of that sort of political slight shift, which shows she's a bit of an operator. Yeah. I am not without sympathies. However, the caveat is, if you stand up representing Donald Trump, you get what's coming to you. Yeah, of course you do. And thank goodness we've got some useful energy available in the White House, because he's finding it all a bit tiring, as we'll discuss in a minute. <laughs> uh, as we go into Washington itself, the President is marking his first 100 days in office this weekend, a time where attention is usually focused on what the President has achieved since his inauguration. So far, however, many of the 45th US President's campaign promises are still far from being a reality. His bill to repeal and replace Obamacare was rejected by members of Congress on both sides of the House. His executive orders imposing a travel ban on nationals from several Muslim-majority countries were ruled unconstitutional by two federal judges. And then, of course, there's the infamous border wall with Mexico, another of Trump's flagship policies that appears to be on shaky ground. TRT World's Azadeh Ansari has more from Washington, D.C. As U.S. President Donald Trump edges closer to his 100 days in office, it seems as if he's sitting on the fence regarding another key campaign promise, the U.S.-Mexico wall. We will build a great wall along the southern border. And Mexico will pay for the wall. Brave words and big promises, but Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto has repeatedly said he has no plans to foot the bill and the infamous wall is no closer to reality. Now Trump has reportedly backpedaled on his demand that a crucial government spending bill, which is before Congress, includes a $1.4 billion down payment for the U.S.-Mexico border wall. But Trump remains defiant, tweeting on Tuesday, don't let the fake media tell you that I've changed my position on the wall. It will get built and help stop drugs, human trafficking, etc. 
Well, Paul Osborne and Paul Blezard are with me in the studio today. And just to add to that sort of catalogue of interesting insights into the president as he gets this significant weekend, um, he's recently said he's found the whole thing a bit exhausting. You know, it's a lot busier than he anticipated, and he's frustrated because he can't drive a car anymore. And, of course, we're all going to be uh, laughing our socks off when that enormous bouffant hair that he has eventually turns grey from the stress. <laughs> he's the leader of the free world. I mean, let's face it, it's a tough job. He obviously wants it. I think he's found it a shock. He had no political political history or experience beforehand, of course. But look at the promises, the campaign promises that he made as he was running for office that are broken, not just the wall, but NAFTA he's turned his back on, or no, he, he's going to turn his back on NAFTA, and now I think the latest is he's going, he's compromised, he's, he's, going, yes, he's, he's, he's going to one, negotiate with the Mexicans and with the Canadians. <laughs> There are lots of things we could say about, you know, he's, he's not done half of things or uh, going to be well, unable to do half the things. a big thing was America first, and here he is starting well, a war in North Korea. Well, let's hope not. Let's hope he's not starting a war in North Korea. But given that it was America first, he's done quite a lot, not just in Syria and Afghanistan with the mother of all bombs. But he seems to be, he seems to be doing that great thing that all politicians tend to do when they dictate office and realise they can't fulfil their election pledges and promises create something outside the walls that makes it look um, like, like you're doing something magnificent. Do you think that's why? That's one of the motivations for all this? I think, I think he, is, he is learning, and you could argue that it's something that he probably should have known beforehand, that, that governing is quite hard yeah. and that things happen that weren't necessarily the things that you sure. were expecting to happen. And it's a bit messy, and it's a compromise. You don't actually get the black or white answer. Exactly, unless and, you know. and, and by, by any standard, as your report said, by any standard, he has not had a successful first 100 days. Um, healthcare reform, disaster, yeah. uh, border wall, nowhere near where he wanted to Never be with it. Happen. Nearly had a government shutdown this week because he insisted on putting funding for the border wall into the budget. He would have been the first president to ever have a government shutdown when his party controlled both houses of Congress, right. and he just about that managed to avoid it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the same week in which, having said America first over and over again, he's now reaching out to China, who he'd been so critical of, to help him fix North Korea. He wasn't going to get involved in Syria. Then he launched a bombing raid on Syria because when things happen like chemical attacks in Syria, the mm. world still looks to the White House for a response. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were talking about Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner and these people being very high up in, in the pecking order without necessarily knowing that much about their experience or their opinions. We're still not certain that there are enough smart people in the room, necessarily, when these unexpected events and big decisions are landing on the desk. I think we've learned a number of things in the first 100 days of Trump's presidency, which is that Steve Bannon is not the force unrequited or unfettered that we worried that he was going to be, that the sense of democracy, of democratic connection within the populace of the United States of America really works. And as I think I said earlier on, that the other two branches of the, of the executive actually make sure that the checks and balances mm. of American democracy do do not give unfettered presidents the right to issue and that seems to be executive orders, orders willy-nilly. And yeah. that's within their lies hope. OK. More conversation about the week's news in just a moment. This is Insight Review. Coming up, we'll tell you which three countries in Africa are set to trial the world's first ever malaria vaccine.